Welcome to another episode of the Spoon Mob Podcast. This week I'm joined by Chef Jamie Simpson. He's the executive chef over at the Culinary Vegetable Institute, CVI, which is up in Milan, Ohio. It's about an hour uh, east of Toledo, an hour west of Cleveland, and about 20 minutes south of Sandusky, which is where Cedar Point is. I first learned about CVI through the documentary on Curtis Duffy uh, called Four Grace. Um, it's when he had his Michelin star restaurant in Chicago. Him kind of leaving the hotel that he was working at in that restaurant, opening up his restaurant Grace and, and kind of that whole process and everything. Obviously, that restaurant has since closed and he's opened a new restaurant. Just it was uh, their financier that they had. Uh, they were supposed to get like percentage of shares of ownership of the restaurant and that didn't go through so that wound up closing and they had like a non-compete or whatever you can read about it it's pretty easy to find but he's got a new restaurant but during that documentary they actually go to cvi and do kind of a restaurant retreat before they open for a couple days and i never knew anything about it that was kind of where i first learned about it and then i looked it up and it's in milan ohio and my parents are probably 20 minutes uh you know, east of that. And it's really close to Sandusky, which is, you know, that whole area pretty familiar with. I just never knew it was there. And I lived there for four or five years. So I'm kind of in that part of Northeast Ohio and just never really knew it existed. So they were doing some dinners. They would do like a vegetable dinners kind of once a month, kind of highlighting a vegetable, tomato, carrot. They were also doing stuff, you know, asparagus dinners. And that was all before COVID and then COVID happened and that kind of put uh, a kibosh uh, essentially on doing those. And they also did an annual dinner. It was like uh, 12 days of Christmas kind of thing where they make a 12 course tasting menu based off the song. And those have kind of stopped, but hopefully are both coming back at some point. Um, We kind of talk about that on the episode, but so we didn't get a chance to do those, but uh, do plan to get up there and and eventually visit uh, CVI and check out the farm and everything too. So There's two different components. There's CVI and then there's also the chef's garden, which is kind of the farm aspect. And what they do is uh, they grow a lot of different produce um, and then they send it to different restaurants uh, around the globe. So Jamie gets into his story of how he first learned about CVI himself, uh, why he wanted to work there, how he wound up working there, kind of everything they got going on now, pre-COVID, post-COVID. You can order stuff online through their online shop, vegetable boxes. um, They have different kind of jams and marmalades and stuff that they're making too as well that you can order um, honeycomb from hives that they have on the property. You can buy those too. So it's a really interesting kind of operation that they have up there. And it's super fascinating just to talk about food in general uh, and not just strictly, you know, vegetables, which is a component of what they do, but it's also kind of pushing boundaries of the food and and different ingredients and and they kind of do this root to tip ethos and philosophy of all the produce and stuff that they use and waste and whatnot so you can follow them on instagram at culinary vegetable institute and also at james underscore simpson 86 is jamie simpson's uh, instagram handle i check out their website too as well um, for more details and just kind of uh, events and different things you can order and and everything like that it's uh, culinary vegetable institute.com Make sure to check out our website too as well, spoonmob.com. You can follow us on Instagram at spoonmob, Twitter and Facebook, spoonmob1. You can follow the podcast on any podcast platform. Uh, We're available on all of them. So just hit follow, subscribe, and you always get the new episodes downloaded directly into your device as soon as they get released. New episodes are on Thursdays every week. And then we're also doing some mini update episodes uh, with some returning guests. Those are coming out on Monday and Tuesdays, depending on the week. So we released those two as well, kind of catching up with people, seeing new concepts that they've opened or are going to open, um, if they moved or work in a different restaurant now, kind of how they wound up there. And this backstory kind of behind their recent life update and career update. So it's been pretty cool to catch up with a lot of those folks who have supported us in the past, and we want to make sure we continue to support them uh, ourselves. So without any further delay, here is my conversation with Chef Jamie Simpson, the executive chef at the Culinary Vegetable Institute. Cool. Well, thanks again for agreeing to come on the podcast. Uh, I have been following the Culinary Vegetable Institute. I didn't even really know about it until I watched. There's a documentary with Curtis Duffy and Four Grace, and it was about his restaurant in Chicago and everything. Him and a good chunk of the staff before they opened came to CVI and did kind of like a, a little retreat there and kind of everything. And then I found out, you know, it was in Milan, Ohio, and I was like, I don't know where that is. And I looked it up and my parents, you know, they live in Wellington, which is like a half hour, like east 
of you guys and i never even knew it was there and you know lived lived there for like 10 years <laughs> like right next door so it's definitely something that i was hoping to eventually kind of get to because you guys were doing some vegetable dinners you do on before the pandemic like once a month and highlight like tomatoes or asparagus and, and stuff like that you guys are doing stuff like once a month then COVID happened and kind of shut all that stuff down so before we kind of get into what you guys got going on, you know, now and everything, I'd like to start at the beginning with everybody. You're originally from Somerville, South Carolina, right? Yeah, that's right. First of all, before we jump in, thanks just for having us on. I appreciate it. It's a, it's huge. It's, it's really, you'll know by the end of this conversation that these conversations are really core to why we exist here. And before we even get into here, yeah, we can step back a little bit. I'm from Somerville, South Carolina. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. I worked in this uh, hotel group there called the Orient Express and was able to travel uh, to eight or nine countries with that hotel group, working in kitchens all over the world. It was there, really, that I fell in love with this place here. You know, when you're able to work in a kitchen and you see how the same radish that you're buying from the chef's garden, you know, is being applied to other kitchens like Robuchon or Lemonoir or, you know, rural parts of Peru, you know, the world's largest exporter of produce, importing produce from a small town in Milan, Ohio or Huron, Ohio is really fascinating to me. Uh, 10 years ago, moved here after a seven or eight year stint at this hotel group. Uh, and before that, barbecue. And before that, uh, was going to be a rock star. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, you are another person. I think we've had two or three people that were heavily involved in the music industry or in a band, and then eventually they got into cooking. What is the correlation between the, those two things that make it, I don't want to say easy switch because nothing's easy to switch careers, but there's definitely something that like overlaps between those two. I'm not sure each of our answers would be the same. I certainly have one. You know, mine, I was in a, a touring punk band. We played in 40 states before I was 21 years old. It was hard. We were dirt poor, right? Um, peanut butter sandwiches in some of the most iconic culinary destinations of the country, you know? And for me, it was just, it was a very, very challenging road, you know, it was the first time like gas prices had gone up. My space is huge, but the internet's not really a viable tool for booking. It's a relationship game still. It was a very different, difficult industry in as a touring musician back then. In the kitchen, it's very similar, right? Like I have a set list and our set list for the night is these seven or eight or 10 courses. Each one of these songs heavily rely on these different stations or these different members in the band. All of us really need to work together uh, front of house and back of house to deliver an experience that ultimately leaves people exiting through the gift shop, right? They're buying CDs and merch and stuff like that to help sort of keep that thing alive. And they're all very, very similar. In my case, I could no longer rely on the four people around me, plus a touring agent or a manager and a recording studio to confidently give me a future in that industry. Moving into the hotel space in this fine dining restaurant, the Charleston Grill, the guys are already polished. It's already an orchestra and I'm just sliding right into a position. Yes, I can be the, uh, you know, the bass player on the grill station here for, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was not like a difficult, my practice schedule's the same, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, when you're going to get crushed and you know, when you really need to be on stage and you know, when, when you just can't fuck it up. And that generally is the same in the music industry. You're, you know, you're, you're a much smaller team and a hundred percent of that team is really, really important. If you're going to try and make it go at it really like a career, like it'd be really fun for me and the, you know, the three guys that you've had on to like, you know, just pop up and do like a, a band, you know, and just like bring that back together but it's not going to be a business. It's just not. Is like the overlap between the two, that grind mentality? Because like when you're touring like that, you play and then it's pack up. We got to get to the next gig. We got to get to the next city. And kind of that's the same with cooking where it's cook this dinner. That's awesome. What are we doing for tomorrow? We got to prep for tomorrow. We got to get ready for tomorrow. We got to hurry up and get all that stuff done. 
So we're on time for both. We're there ready to kind of go on stage at 5 p.m. when the doors open or 7 p.m. when the opening act's done. I mean, I wish it were that organized when I was growing up in the space. It was like, all right, we're in St. Louis. We don't have any more shows for the rest of the month. We're renting a hotel room by the hour right next to Larry Flint's like Hustler Club. And uh, this really sucks. Does anybody have a library card so we can go and get on the internet and try and book the next show? You know, that kind of world. I think the kitchen has always attracted misfits of sorts, you know, like and very creative people. So beyond musicians, you see artists and potters and, you know, hobbyists and all kinds of different writers, even different creative people that are really excel in the kitchen. Also, um, sports. If anyone was ever like involved in like organized sports, they generally do really well in the, in the kitchen as well. One of our former um, chefs here worked in the kitchen in California with a, a guy with a Super Bowl ring. You know, he was just a cook. It was pretty cool. You know, th- those guys understand like, you know, team lift. Before getting back into cooking and, and winding up at the Charleston Grill, did you cook at all like in high school, work in any restaurants or anything like that? Yeah, I started in that barbecue restaurant like two weeks before I turned uh, 15. I had some friends also in the music industry that sort of swayed me into that. And that literally was like a kitchen full of musicians. It was a ridiculous environment, like a really, really fun, you know, times we would like turn these five gallon buckets upside down and, and duct tape them to our feet. Right. And then everybody online would be like two or three feet higher off the ground and try and work a service, you know, standing on buckets, walking around basically in stilts. And, you know, it was it was a debauchery and fun and just kind of a just absurd. I really loved it. It was my first like sort of jump into um, any kind of job. You know, it was my first job it was a few weeks before legal age working in a, in a kitchen. You know, my first culinary task was take this 50 pound bag of onions, peel them and shave them on a meat slicer, a hundred percent of them. Right. And it was horrible, horrible job for any, any, I would, I wouldn't give it to anybody, you know, putting a, an onion on a meat slicer is just throwing juice and then increasing surface area as much as possible. Right. <laughs> it was just not, it's not fun. I kind of fell in love with it. It was flexible. You know, it allowed me to take uh, days off that I needed and um, to keep that music thing going too. So at the end of the kind of road with the music thing, because, you know, you're in the band, you're working in a recording studio. Do you remember at what point you were like, I don't want to do this anymore? Because I remember Tyler Stemmer, who's the chef at Pleasantry in Cincinnati. He was in a similar situation. He said to me, we were just playing a gig and it was at a bar. And I just looked around and I was like, I don't want to be here right now. Like, it's like 2 a.m. I, I don't want to do this. Well, I, I sort of alluded to it earlier, actually, that moment in St. Louis in that hourly motel by the Larry Flint Hustler Club. And, you know, people live there in this motel. It was horrible. It was filthy. There was no next step. You know, we, we had no money, you know, no real food and no plan for tomorrow. It's on everybody, right? It's, it was not. It was not any single person's fault. It was all of our faults. We're focused on the the day, and then tomorrow, and then tomorrow, and then you're not looking far enough out. When you get to the end of that calendar, you're done. Restaurants are very guilty of that as well. When we started looking at closures in restaurants, th- there was five days of cash flow. Here, I've got this this restaurant. It's the best restaurant in town. Everybody comes. It's fully booked. But, you know, your expenses are level to your income and you you can't survive for five days without income. That's what being in the band was like. It's just not, it's got to be sustainable. So did you know from there when you wanted to get out of the music industry, the thing you wanted to go into was cooking? Yeah, I knew that it was a direction that I had a little bit more control over professionally. I mean, I was already cooking. I was already in this fine dining restaurant. I came in very green to the space. But yeah, I knew that uh, there were less variables. Did you just apply to the Charleston Grill or did you know somebody that worked there? Like, how'd you wind up getting in there? It was a pretty famous award-winning restaurant at the time, right? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, It was the best. You know, no, I didn't. I went um, 
I went first to the Charleston Place Hotel. Actually, a guy in the recording studio was like, hey, there's this uh, there's this sort of job fair at the this Charleston Place Hotel. It was like right across the street from where I lived at the time. Uh, and he's like, yeah, you got to uh, you, you should just go in there and check it out. See if you can pick up a job there. And I did. I popped in. I remember my interview. The guy's like, I kind of like kind of bullshitted my way through this whole interview process. But the chef that was interviewing me is like, name five types of lettuce. And by the way, like I like just to challenge all the listeners out there to go ahead and name five types of lettuce. I mean, I can today. I can probably go to 35. It's my job now. <laughs> but but it was like, first of all, like arugula is not a lettuce. You know, <laughs> I want to just throw that one out there. So that one doesn't count. But anyway, I just sort of limped through. Uh, they seemed to be desperate enough for employees to hire me. Um, I worked with that company for eight years and and had a lot of great people there. It was a we had a great family. And they also kind of pushed you to go to culinary school, right? You went to the Culinary Institute of Charleston. Yeah. So they have a they the the, the company had a program. If you go to college, uh, applying something basically of your current job or your current task, um, we will help fund that tuition. So the old Johnson and Wales in Charleston turned into the Culinary Institute of Charleston. I took a tuition basically plus like some state funded project, whatever grant and was able to actually make a few hundred bucks per semester to go to uh, college. And it was five years after I, I had no real intention of going to college. It had it not been for that program. I, I certainly wouldn't have, but to take like math classes and science classes and economics and psychology and things like that in college and have it paid for was a huge opportunity that I had to had to take. And that that also caused me to go into those evening shifts at the Charleston Grill. So I like to ask this question to everybody. If someone comes up to you now, someone in your kitchen, and they're like, hey, I'm super passionate about being a chef. I want to own my own restaurant one day. Do you think I should go to culinary school? What would you tell them? Run. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't believe that this industry requires debt. I think if you can get go to college and do the thing and and try to avoid coming out of it in debt would be the most successful use of your time. If not, then invest that money on like traveling around the world and working in restaurants that you want to work in. You're, you're going to get paid for your time. So your debts aren't going to be as high. You're going to have to figure out housing, but that's very doable in today's world. And I think it's a better proposition. You learn much faster, you know, working in other kitchens than you will sitting in front of a uh, some burnt out instructor talking about dicing carrots. So after you graduate, what happens between that time and the time that you wind up where you're at now? So that three year period, I was working then with the hotel in this program where we were able to bounce from location to location. It was some sort of property probably an HR incentive, you know, to get like the company sort of cohesiveness together. So we had the ability, you know, in every department really to go to other properties. And this company, 52 properties globally, um, had some very attractive destinations for me. Took advantage of that. I had a two or three year period where I was able to visit, you know, Iceland and England and France and Peru and Mexico. And it was really also very valuable because you're already then in and you know sort of the people there because you're in the same company. So you're able to get back into the kitchen and and cook some food or or just enjoy the property. And that was that was great. But like I said earlier too, like that moment is also where I started to see the broad reach of my friend Farmer Lee Jones at the Chef's Garden. I knew them, I knew of them. Um, I never knew the kind of reach and would realize really that these bucket list destinations for me are also customers of this farm in Ohio. So I decided to come up here and not to move, not to live, but to work just like in the other places. It was This was a four-month opportunity. Farmer Lee said, I've got this thing called Roots Conference. Um, it's the first thing. We've never done anything like it before. We want to bring a bunch of chefs in and we need someone really like in-house that can help coordinate the culinary piece of it. So four months, you know, it's like, okay, I think I can do it. Cleared it up, packed my bags and came up for four months. I didn't know what the future would be, but essentially I've never left. You know, this is 10 years later. It's in the middle of nowhere, but it's in the 
it's sort of in the middle of everything. We're in the very center of this, right? And, and so many paths cross right here, yet it is so remote in the agricultural heart of the country. It's very cool. You guys are two hours from Columbus and Columbus, we've always had uh, the reputation of being this, you know, giant test market. It's something ridiculous. Like 80% of the population is within a thousand miles, you know, cause you have New York right over there and Chicago. And so the only thing that you're not close to is, you know, the California cities that are super populous. So that's kind of why a lot of companies have made Ohio parts of Ohio, either their distribution center, or distribution hub and stuff like that. And and it kind of speaks in a way to the same thing that you guys have going on up there. You might be, you know, in the middle of, of nowhere, not surrounded by a bunch of buildings and things like that. But logistically, you guys are kind of right in the middle of somewhere probably between 70 and 80 percent of, of the population. Yeah. The, so historically, this place has always been agricultural forever. And imagine like, you know, pre-railroad, pre-even trucking, you know, like big, big volume trucking. You're looking at uh, farmland in between, right in between Detroit and Buffalo, New York and Cleveland and Toledo and Columbus, even Pittsburgh. Everything's like one day by truck. So it was a huge, huge piece of food, you know, for the, for a lot of really big uh, populated cities at that time. Railroads sort of changed that. We moved out west. It's pretty central. And we're right on Lake Erie. It's the shallowest of the Great Lakes. So it gives us sort of this little warm fall. Like our seasons are a little longer than um, than the rest of the region around us. That's pretty cool. So when your four-month internship, stage, whatever you want to kind of label it is up, because they basically make you executive chef, you know, after that four months is up, right? So how did they tell you or how did all that go down? Yeah, no, there was an executive chef here. Um, I, my role coming into this position was um, chef liaison. You know, someone, I mean, basically at this place, this ho- we host like 600 visiting chefs a year in this building. So outside of the executive chef who's working on kitchen related tasks, you really needed someone sort of communicating with people who are coming to the farm. And, it, you know, outside of like their contact even, but someone who could really speak their language. And I, I had this like, and I do, I still, I feel like I've, I feel much more comfortable when I'm speaking to former and fellow cooks um, than I do with other people. I feel a little bit more like I can relate, you know, and they can relate back and it's a better just conversation in general. But my role was chef liaison. I, I eventually at some point, the executive chef just threw in the towel, like, like we do. And um and I sort of absorbed some of those roles, you know, I'm working with like the farm on product development. I work with the marketing team on, you know, communication around a specific thing and the sales team about, you know, like application. How do you use this random little leaf? And then, you know, the guest chefs on the dishes, you know, we, like you mentioned earlier, Grace um, doing their menu development here for that for grace documentary i mean we've we've done that for so many places they just happen to have a camera on i mean we alenia was was here before alenia opened speaking of chicago you know jose andreas did his last vegetable book here um a lot of restaurants before they open will come they bring their staff they want to work through a few dishes just get people in the ground to recognize the importance of this carrot you know moving forward is also really valuable they we're so disconnected. Think about this. Like I'm on the phone. I'm in this, this hotel basement. I got to get a, an order in. I need a box of zucchini and a box of rabbits, you know, tomorrow. And that box of zucchini that was harvested, you know, by who knows who really, uh, who knows where was, was picked. The zucchini was picked to fit in the box, right? <laughs> you know, the box is designed for the zucchini. The zucchini is designed for the box. And then that box is designed to fit on a pallet and that pallet designed to fit on a truck and that truck fits in a warehouse and it's just the system. And tomorrow that box arrives and that's it. You know, that's my zucchini. And like, I don't agree with it. I don't settle for it. I'm not down with it. I think, I think the model's really built around the distribution of that product and not about the, the life of it itself. You know, it's not celebrating these ingredients. I think in this industry, we're just sort of disconnected. This, this place allows us to reconnect with agriculture in a way that no other place does. 
the big thing is kind of the chef retreats and restaurant retreats, but I mean, you guys have done fundraisers, charitable events, weddings, public dinners too, as well. Like you guys do a lot of different things there too. It's not just one note, like it's a farm and restaurants come here and and everybody has a little stay. No, it's pretty dynamic. I mean, that's the kitchen that we're in was designed by Charlie Trotter and Thomas Keller and, you know, Alain Ducasse and Chris Hastings and, you know, this like power couple of chefs um, designed this place that we're in right now. I mean, it was just like, just from the beginning, it was a win. So yeah, we'll do, uh, we'll do fundraisers for the Boku's Door Foundation. We do classes with, you know, Rosendale and Rosendale events. And we'll do, you know, workshops with, uh, are the people that we try and bring on here as, as, uh, as much as possible, you know, and, and generally that lines up pretty well with customers of the farm. Not always, but most times, you know, if you're buying produce from the chef's garden, you're in a place that sort of gets the whole agricultural piece of it. And, you know, I hope to celebrate that. It's about 600 varieties of vegetables here. There's maybe, we manage 10,000 skews. <laughs> Those skews are always growing too, right? And so you're, it's just this impossible three-dimensional chess thing that happens here somehow every season. It's pretty cool. How many acres is the actual like farmland? Do you know? Yeah, it's about 300 acres and then production is about one third of it. Some years less to, you know, down to like 88 acres and some years more. What we're constantly doing in that, that chess board is rotating crops, right? So you're, you're only pulling from like a third of the land and then another thirds and cover crops sort of regenerating the soil. And another third is laying fallow, also sort of regenerating the soil. So it's it's an expensive way to farm, um, but it's ultimately a, a better way to to farm. For those who don't know, you know, you'll see up in that region and a lot of states, like you'll see cornfields, and you're not supposed to plant corn, you know, really in consecutive years because it, the nutrients that it takes out of the soil the next time around, you'll get a less flourishful or the crop won't be as good. So usually you see. One year they'll do corn and then the next year they'll do like soybeans because they take out different nutrients. They might let it rest, do nothing. They might plant like winter wheat or something like that. But that's kind of the the idea behind the rotation. Right. Yeah. They're all about, I mean, these big conventional farms are really all about tons per acre. They don't really care about soil health. They care about yield. The only way to increase yield really is through soil health, but there's this whole synthetic path you can take as well. So now there's these like roundup red resistant, you know, crops and seeds and these planes fly over and spray the whole damn town with roundup. Uh, And the seeds that they plant are resistant to it so they can grow. And there's not a single speck of life living in these fields. It's just all synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. It's kind of crazy, but it's all about yield. And it's not the farmer's fault. It's just a model that exists because of our government. You know, it's reasons that Earl Butts, Secretary of Agriculture, says get big or get out. And the only way to do that is to just grow monocrops and just do one thing and a lot of it. You also got the chef's garden there. What's the difference between the two or is it just the names interchangeable? The chef's garden is a farmer, right? It's the the vegetable grower, the the supplier of about a you know a thousand restaurants globally. The culinary vegetable institute is the culinary piece of it, right? It's the voice of culinary reason. It's a, a marketing arm. It's a place for food and beverage professionals to come, right? You know, so of course you can come to the farm, but you're going to stay at the Hampton Inn if it wasn't for this place. So there's uh, some overnight accommodations for like 10 or 12 people here. And um, it's more of a creative side of the business. You know, it's a place where we get to really cook the things we grow. Now, you also got the place certified as a cannery. No. So I got the certifications through the UC Davis Berkeley in better process control school to be like in the uh, like preservation space and to be better at it and more educated for it. And we can can foods, but we cannot sell foods we can unless we're working through HACCP and process authority. So why that's come in handy is really uh, on a small scale is waste management in the kitchen. 
is really to have our own working root cellar to preserve and ferment our way through the seasons. Uh, but then on a large scale, which I hope to talk about on this call, is product development we're doing for the farm right now. And these are like jams and jellies by the thousands, right? And teas by the thousands. And we, we, we last month did 20,000 pounds of this root vegetable sandwich mix that's kind of cured like deli meat. You know, it's just like, it's stuff now that I'm able to work with manufacturers to co-pack for us and us resell, which has been really, really, really great for managing agricultural waste, to be frank. And a lot of that stuff is available in the online shop too. That was kind of born out of COVID kind of, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Home delivery. We thought we were diverse, we, you know, when we're working with cruise ships and, uh, you know, casinos and hotels and independent restaurants and whatever else. But we were not diverse when every restaurant on the planet shut down overnight. Uh, home delivery was an absolute must on March 16th. You know, we haven't looked back. We, we dedicated a lot of time and resources and into developing a direct to consumer sort of business that was you know, really helping people, you know, helping people that couldn't go to the store or helping people who lived in places that couldn't just buy quality food. And we started shipping vegetable boxes of people all over the, all over the country overnight, you know, and it was a really good model. A natural extension of that is like, all right, well, we're not doing dinners and here's 700 pounds of tomatoes that don't have a home. Jamie, better process control school guy. What's the dish, right? What are we doing? Uh, and so to be able to you know, take some of that and, uh, and turn it into something that we can sell later has been huge, right? And has been a, a really, really important part of our existence. So setting all that stuff up, was it a little bit easier because there was already a similar model with sending produce to different restaurants uh, around the world? So it was just like, okay, here's kind of the foundation for that. What do we need to change to get it to people? And then what do we need to change from that to kind of move into the CPG space? I think the hardest thing that we didn't really expect to see or didn't even really calculate was like, if we're growing X amount of produce, you know, in volume, right. And we're, we're shipping those to customers whose check average is like, you know, two to 300 bucks restaurants, big boxes of vegetables. And now we're shipping check averages at $89 a box, right. Or eight, whatever it is. How many more home delivery boxes do we have to do to make that work? Right. Like, cause it's not the same amount. It's more right? That you have to basically grow a, a home delivery model greater than your restaurant volume ever was to make that work. So it, there was some serious, like, you know, challenges on the front end of this thing. Finding a new market was, was pretty tricky. And then I, I don't think it wasn't a big jump for me to go like, I've been preserving stuff forever here, right? I treat the CVI kitchen as if it's, it's like little farmhouse in the country, anywhere in the world. Right. So in the basement could be kimchi or miso or pickles, right? Or sauerkraut or whatever. To do that on a large scale was a really, really cool and fun, still is today, really great adventure. Right. It's like here is here's 900 pounds of strawberries. You have three days before they're done. What's the dish? And also it's got to go through all the proper channels and be a, you know, a legitimate product. Doesn't mean I can just like turn out a barrel of strawberry vinegar and bottle it and sell it and out the back door, you know, because it's interstate district. There's a lot of, there's a lot of laws and regulations around like preserved packaged foods. So is kind of the next step, or maybe you guys already do this and just nobody knows about it, either partnering or creating at home meal kits. Since there was that rise in kind of people cooking at home because of the pandemic, you have all those stories of people getting back into baking bread and stuff like that and, and starting their own businesses. And now the farmer's markets are, you know, they don't have enough stalls, some of them for, for all the people who have these small businesses. So is that a model that you guys can tap into where it's maybe you already are providing the produce for things like, you know, Blue Apron and Plated or starting your own version? I mean, obviously that takes a lot of capital and it'd be a slow roll. You'd start small and, and work it out there. Or is that just something that's not really in line with kind of where you guys want to expand. 
I think it's in line. I think it's just a space we don't really want to touch right now. They're really, even of those like Blue Apron and, um, you know, HelloFresh models, they're not operating really profitably, you know, like for the amount of work and like, let's just say man hours and calories required to turn that business out. They are building valuable assets like distribution models and like, you know, order on demand and subscription things and things like that. But like, it's still, it's a very, very hard business. Right, it's, it's it's not easy. Um, so what we hope to do is provide enough content with recipes and like you know for home consumers, you know, and also value in the nutritional aspects of it. We built a lab that can measure nutrient density, and that's really really interesting um, when you're able to see that not all carrots are created equal. You know, and this carrot might be 300 times higher in beta carotene than this one, right? Like. Now I think you're getting into something where like I've, my doctor's orders eat more veggies, but like they're not all the same. And if I've got to eat these things, I want to, you know, make an impact for the home consumer that seems to be working, right? It seems to be a pretty valuable resource for us. Yeah, no, I don't know. I don't, I don't really see meal kits per se. We are seeing like, we've got some bread kits available and think, you know, we've some simple, easy, fun stuff like that, that. I think it's a little bit of traction and they're fun, but you know, I'm not sure they're the future. I've heard the term hyper seasonal before you guys are, I've seen described as micro seasonal. Is that just kind of somebody applied that term to you or is, is that an actual thing? No, I mean, not really. It's like, look at it. Um, I don't know if it's the Chinese calendar or doesn't have four seasons, right? It's like when the caterpillars are falling under the you know, cherry blossom trees, you know, or wherever. It's like we as a European society have four distinct seasons. It's not really that interesting. You know, when you think about like, well, it's fall. So we've got pumpkins and butternut squash on the menu, you know, and we've got some, you know, I don't even know what else, dried field corn. And what are those like, just those maple syrup or whatever. The season within the year of fall is really interesting, right? Like we're looking at, you know, you'll see like tomatoes will overlap with little tiny butternut squash. And there's a dish there, right? Or that those butternut squash will mature or even the zucchini will mature into these really hard shell, hard seed sort of interesting animals that are far beyond, you know, that one zucchini that fit in that box. The farm celebrates every part of the plant's life. Right. And you can see that very distinctly on the website. You can see it in the product thing. That's how you get to 10,000 SKUs with 600 varieties of vegetables, every part of the plant. So that micro seasonal, hyper seasonal thing is really about celebrating today. So we're not so specific on that fall vignette, right? It's, it's sort of like the squash stem, the leaf, the seed, the bloom is available today. The pumpkins, they're only two or three inches big and they have a bloom attached. Is that the pumpkin you want? <laughs> because that's the, that's the pumpkin we have right now. And I think it's kind of cool. You try and use every part of the plant when you're cooking. It's been labeled as root to tip. Is that like where the challenge lies in, in vegetable forward cooking? Using off cuts or using what's considered to be or would be otherwise kind of waste or, or byproduct? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't really see it as the challenge. I see, I see it as like the, the best part, you know, it's like, it's getting away from that grocery store zucchini. You know, I'm going to keep referencing that thing. Cause it's like, it's not, it's not that it's bad. It's just that like, it's the only thing that we think about when we picture the plant. And by the way, that's only like 15% of the plant's mass. So, you know, so here we are like, farmers going through and we pick the thing when it's deemed ready and we're walking past all the other parts of that thing. And the plant's really amazing. The leaves, the stems, the blooms, the little buds, you know, the blooms after they're dried up and shriveled up a little bit, even like the fruit after they're way past what we would typically think as ripe or ready. Um, every part of the thing is really, really cool. That is what makes vegetables more interesting, right? It's not like the guy grilling the center cut zucchini on the grill and diamond shapes and putting a nice sauce and pasta or something with it. It's about like the whole thing uh, to me and only because I'm here. 
right? It, is, it doesn't necessarily make sense. Like if I'm on Santa Barbara uh, on the on the pier with seafood, I might be going that direction. If I'm on a cattle farm, you know, I might be going that direction. I think just inherently, I find more interest in those other parts. In terms of produce and product that you guys grow and, and everything there, you guys also do some experimental stuff I read. What all is that? We've done some seed production for seed companies um, like Row 7 or those kinds of places. There's this guy that like dedicated his life to peas. Fred Hempel, this tomato guy. Calvin Lamborn, the pea guy. The Some of these guys are crossbreeding varieties. They send them to us to essentially formally vet as a viable crop. We have a research greenhouse that probably has 40, 50, 60 varieties of plants in it. We've got a field dedicated to research crops um, and see new interesting varieties there. I just had this, um, I don't know, some sort of West African flower that like basically made my throat close <laughs> you know, from the research uh, facility. I couldn't breathe for 45 minutes to an hour. Um, but I think that's part of the, you know, part of the job. There is some really interesting stuff they're growing. And every once in a while, one of those things really is the future. But there's so many varieties out there. Even if you could just look at tomatoes, you could just do literally like Fred Hempel. You could just grow tomatoes your whole life, right? And different varieties every single day forever. It's There are thousands and thousands of varieties. So for us, like we'll do, we do a research project with Louisiana State University, reoccurring. They have a, a program where they're breeding new varieties of sweet potatoes. They send us a hundred or so new varieties of sweet potatoes every year. I'll taste every single one of them, um, write down tasting notes on all of them, send back feedback on like oxidation rate or cell structure or moisture content, bricks, pH, and flavor, most importantly. In exchange for that work, we get five varieties that we want forever. Right. And so then we can grow those varieties and that can be part of our catalog of sweet potatoes. And that's the same deal. It's like every once in a while you find a real, real winner. You know, that that one sweet potato that's like crazy, you know, that tastes like like creme anglaise. Right. Or like marshmallows and sweet potatoes you know, kind of baked together. Like there's some cool stuff out there. It's been really fun to uh to uh, uncover some of that. When you're creating new dishes, do you start with a singular ingredient or is it just kind of what's in season? Do you work outward from there? Like, because you have all the stuff at your fingertips, all these different ingredients, experimental stuff that can be overwhelming at times from a creative standpoint. We're like, Oh, I could grab this. I could grab this. So you almost have to edit yourself too. So how does your kind of creative dish process work? Generally starts with a walk through the garden, right? And like, sometimes it's not just that one thing. Uh, sometimes it is. Um, sometimes it's like, it's all the things, you know? And, um, and I said this the other day, le sometimes less is more and sometimes more is more. It depends on that walk, really. Nature generally is our, you know, inspiration here. Makes sense. We don't really write menus. Like we'll do these dinners for people. And I, I typically don't, I'm on the computer right here in this room right now, writing menus for this evening's dinner. It's not, it's not like next month or two months out or five months out. You never see a menu for an event from ours early ever. You could see some, some vague stuff. If someone really needs a menu, we'll keep it really, really vague. And it'll say like carrot. That's all I got for you right now. And like, and, and you want to keep it that way, I promise. Because when we get closer up, you know, under these days and these this this walk through the garden will really kind of go a long way. I mean, we can fall back on craft when we were really, really busy. We're all guilty of that. But it's nice to leave a lot of room for inspiration. How complex can you get with like a, a vegetable dish? Because, you know, every chef's different. Some want to showcase the ingredient as close to natural as it is and all the natural flavors is some want to layer different flavor on it too as well so i mean is there a point where you can do too much with a vegetable dish even if you're focusing on kind of one ingredient like even if it's a carrot dish and you want to incorporate all these things 
at some point, can you almost muddy the waters in a way and, and not highlight the carrot anymore? I'm not sure if I'm qualified to answer the question. Like, who am I to say that you've gone too far, <laughs> right? Like, I have my opinions on things, you know, and then um, and other people have theirs. I think it's totally subjective. We've gone pretty far, sometimes successfully and sometimes not. You hope to to find out exactly where it is you fail uh, so that you can sort of learn from it and try again the next time and embrace those epic mistakes. And you guys do cook meat there too as well. Like you're not strictly vegetable and fruit only. I mean, it, it's what, like a 80-20 kind of ratio? It depends on the seasons. In the fall, it's like, you know, we're more like uh, pork, you know, pigs. We raised uh, 20 pigs right up to the pandemic on property. They were a function of waste management for us too, kitchen scraps. So we were doing a bunch of dinners then. So we were cooking a lot of food and we producing buckets of compost that ultimately wasn't compost. It was food. It was future ham. You know, that was really, really fun. We've got a, you know, no, I, we're not, we're not vegetarians. We, we do celebrate vegetables, but we cook, uh, you know, we cook product from other great farmers that also farm lamb and chickens and, and pigs. And these summer months, we're really doing a lot with eggs right now. Anyways, I think it's a great animal protein that, um, that lends itself well to basically every vegetable coming out of the fields right now. Is the the overall goal, or maybe you guys have already made it there to be just kind of a hundred percent, you know, sustainable, no carbon footprint. It's sort of an unstated journey that we've been on for, um, for 10 years. It's with no fault to the other large and let's say broad line distributors. I have eliminated all of them slowly. And, and it took 10 years to do that. I mean, I still have to order parchment paper and plastic wrap and things like that, but I don't currently have a broadliner, you know, which is for me a lifetime achievement award. It's not because it was like, I'm really reliant on like, you know, this guy's thing. It just means it's so much more work. It means you gotta, you gotta find the milk guy and you gotta find the, the, the cheese guy and you gotta find the meat guy and the farmer that grows the thing. And that's been a slow sort of journey. We're not there yet. It's uh, definitely a direction we're, we're moving in. And we're never going to be, I don't want to be, I'll just say that, also a dairy. If you ever milked a cow, that's fun. You know, you milk a cow twice, it's pretty cool because you get the, you know, rhythm of it. But you do it 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. every day forever. No, thanks. I don't even want a staff for that, but I want milk. And same like with grain and bread. Yes, we, we want to order really great flour and I want to grow it and I want to mill it, but I don't want to mill all of it. You know, I want to like a really good grower to, you know, grow grain and mill flour. Part of that too is it helps with just keeping other businesses alive too as well. And the interconnection between you guys and them and, and them and other restaurants and stuff too. So we have a lot of direct relationships with, with growers who are doing good things sustainability has become like a movement of its own the past handful of years. However, a lot of, you know, sustainability or the aspects of it isn't exactly cost effective for a majority of the population. You know, uh, electric cars are great, but a lot of them are priced to the point where your average person can't afford an electric car, you know? How does that stuff change? Like in relation to the food where yes, people would love to eat more vegetables, but in vegetables and fruits are maybe a bad example because they're not super, super expensive, but they can be, you know, depending on the variety and stuff. But at some point, you know, somebody working a minimum wage job, it's like, well, I have to buy the, the box of Twinkies because they're shelf stable and they last for a week. It's not fair because we're in this model that, that sort of forces people into this situation. But there's like, even restaurants are stuck too. There's this race to the bottom on, on pricing and whatever else. And like, you're trying to be competitive with your pricing and like, what's the real cost of food, right? And like, I don't think we really fully truly know, you know, if you ever go to, you know, a fast food restaurant or even a big chain, you're still not paying the actual cost of, you know, of, of food. A lot of these ingredients in general are subsidized. Which, which makes them more available at lower prices, but that's being paid for by someone else, right? Or taxes. It's sort of a really challenging question. What is sustainable, right? And it, it's, it's obviously, you know, an environmental right question. It's an economic question. 
All right. And if you looked at like, I guess beyond the you know environmental impacts of, of what you do, but pricing is such a critical piece of it too. You want to be here tomorrow. There's all these like sustainable restaurants, local restaurants, you know, uh, that, uh, that, that are short lived. Right. And it's not because they weren't doing the right thing. It's because they weren't charging the right prices. And it sucks because then when you charge the right prices, then the people, right, <laughs> vote with their dollars and vote on lesser expensive food. And so the models just busted up and it's not conducive, especially in a time of economic crisis and a pandemic and everything else, right? Like screw your, you know, your paper straws. We're going back to like styrofoam boxes and, you know, plastic, right? It's like, we got to get this food out. And that, I think we saw a lot of that in the last uh, couple of years of sliding sort of backwards. And we're going to see it more. You're going to see it more in, uh, in grocery stores and the way people purchase food. You know, it's not about the, it's not a question of sustainability when you don't have enough money to feed yourself. It's a question of survival. I think it's not fair. With some of like the containers, you know, you just mentioned like styrofoam with to-go food. And, and obviously it's a big proponent of what happened with COVID. There are alternatives, but those alternatives are more expensive. Restaurants live on the margins, very fine margins. So they can't exactly spend money on a more biodegradable container or something like that. Is a lot of it as simple as just getting the price down, do you think, on some of that stuff that's innovative and it's just economies of scale and you just got to get the price down to where it works? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've, I've, oh my gosh. I've, I've been down this like packaging rabbit hole for the farm for a long time. And we're just as guilty. You know, if you look, we're here, here we are we're open, honest with you now. It's like, we're a farm. We, we preach about sustainability, and, you know, the right agricultural practices. And then we're, we're putting these beautiful, perfect vegetables and plastic recyclable containers and mailing them via FedEx to Hong Kong. There's a lot to unpack there, um, but specifically as it relates to packaging, the industry is not there yet. It's just not like there is amazing, beautiful, perfect, recycled, recyclable, home compostable packaging out there. There is, but it is insanely expensive because it's not really in any huge scale, right? Box liners. There's unbelievable box liners made out of unbelievably creative materials that are just byproducts of something that you can literally wash down your drain. I love them. I can't, we can't afford it. I've, I just had a conversation with a guy who grows uh, mycelium packaging, custom forms to fit our T10s out of, out of mushrooms and sawdust, right? But like they cost more than the product itself. <laughs> I love you, but I can't do this. You know, it just doesn't work. I think it'll come around for sure. There's going to be definitely, it's going to come around. There's going to be a few manufacturers who figure it out. How does inflation impact you guys at, you know, working farm and, and the Institute and everything outside of, you know, obvious costs like shipping costs go up and, and fuel costs, but do you guys feel that impact too as well? Oh, definitely. I mean, our, um, our shipping costs, you know, are a big part of our costs when, FedEx and UPS, uh, you know, increase their prices. Our prices increase as well. You can't, you can't swallow it all. Um, fortunately, we control a large part of our own supply chain. We don't have the same kind of problems that most businesses have today. But you know, we're not waiting on microchips. We're waiting on a good rain. <laughs> yeah, that's a very different problem, right? It's just farming. With farming, I was having this conversation with somebody the other day. We were talking about college and student debt, and they moved to somewhere that has a, a lot of cornfields, and cornfield biome was up for sale, and the person was going to sell it, and they were going to build apartments. And basically, you know, we were talking, that farmer, his kids don't want to do it. You know, they don't want to take over that business. So what's he supposed to do? You know, he's going to retire. So he sells the land. They're going to build an apartment there, and it's one less field of corn or, or whatever. And it's not a glamorous trade. Some people believe, but a lot of people are told, you know, you need to go to college and be an engineer or be a doctor and stuff. How do you get more people interested in farming, you know, and instead of trying to become a, a software engineer, is it even possible, you know, to revert kind of back the other way? Cause we need more farmers. Like you need, you know, we need to keep growing things. We need to keep the food supply. 
I think the last five years has been more small farm startup, you know, than like maybe ever. It's good for that's, you know, you see like um, John Deere and, you know, small equipment companies are all growing, you know, and I think that that's a result of more small farms as well. But you got to make farming sort of sexy again. And like you, you have these like that guy, the old farmer that's been farming the cornfield forever. Like that model sucks and it doesn't exist without government help. And so like if he had to sell his product at the established commodity price and that was it, you know, and wasn't subsidized to do that, he wouldn't exist for another year. Nobody would. And none of them will. And that's the sort of a it's like this like crutch that like we that farming model sort of lives on and exists on. It's not at all sustainable. And I wouldn't want to jump into that business either. Just so like the family can keep its like 500 acres of cornfield. It's not the future, you know, especially like for me, it's not the future. But I mean, some people jump in and they keep that thing going and they uh, do the thing. And it's important. You see it today with food problems, you know, in Europe, it's important. You know, you got to keep those wheat fields growing, you know, and you got to keep those corn fields growing. But what's the actual cost of that stuff? Is the dream for you still wanting to go back to Charleston and own a small house and cook small, elaborate dinners? Where do you read this stuff? <laughs> Where'd you come up with this? In general, my interest is in this global culinary destination is in, and that can be anywhere. I remember speaking to a journalist almost 10 years ago about this, and that was my my goal. I want to buy a, an old plantation house and turn it into a, like a sort of a nice little place to have dinner and stay the night and have the beehives and the chicken coops and the goats. And you know what? I even told this story to my girlfriend, now fiance, and uh, she's like, what happened to your dream? <laughs> you, know, you wanted to move back home. You sold me on that you know, kind of vision. And I do. I, I would love to, I would love for that to be a part of my future for sure. I need more capital. So like where that can just be like an expense and a, a really fun thing. But I, after this pandemic, man, I, I really don't want to have to rely on a restaurant and four hotel rooms above it, you know, to stay alive. I don't. We need to build a more sustainable model for that. Will any of the kind of public dinners at VCI ever return? You know, you guys were doing like the July was like the tomato dinner um, where it was like the whole thing was built around tomato and you do an asparagus one and pumpkins. And, and you guys did also, I think in Christmas time, the 12 days of Christmas dinner, or 10 days. I don't remember the song, how that goes. Yeah, we do a 12 course dinner called the 12 days of Christmas. And it was basically every verse of the song inspired the course. There's a lot of poultry in the song. So we had to find some like fun. It's like turtle doves and geese and, you know, swans are swimming and ducks are laying or whatever. It's a lot of uh, calling birds even. It's an unbelievable dinner. It's an unbelievable production. It is sets and props and carts and, you know, bells and whistles. And it's very, very cool. It's a fun evening that we would generally would do a few times during the month of December in a row, sell the dining room out to 24 guests at a time and just turn. It's cool, but it is 12 days of prep. And, I'm, and I haven't yet signed myself up for that one yet. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work. The vegetable showcase dinner as we would do monthly that, yeah, that'd be like six or seven courses of like of a single ingredient and really show people how diverse and dynamic that zucchini can be. And it's not that green thing on the shelf in the supermarket, right? It's a lot more than that. And that's the function of those dinners. We'd bring the growers from that particular crop in to also sit down and eat during those dinners. So they could really get an understanding of like what this thing's all about. That I thought was my favorite part about those dinners. We haven't started those up yet. I know I'm afraid to open those gates. Honestly, I we could. I'm not ready. It's not our financial model. It's just for fun. And we're not really quite ready to just go back to fun yet. We're doing a lot of work on this manufacturing thing. I mean, we've done a lot of work. We did the book leading up to the product development. And, you know, the farm is, is really the, the work that we're trying to do right now. 
what's next for you guys? Like what's on, on the horizons? There's a few different directions. You know, I've got this personal, like my, one of my projects I've been focused on is this vegetable deli meat sort of thing um, that will be manufacturing at scale which is sort of like a big, just like to me, it's like just solving a gap in the grocery store. You, you know, you have the, the boar's head ham and turkey and cheese and stuff like that, but there's not like vegetable that's really like celebrating vegetables. There's some plant-based options out there, but it's not really the plants. And that's the thing I think I'm really focused on. It's another way to sort of, sort of spread out the business a little bit. And then the farm itself, we, I mean, we hired a, um, an amazing woman, Amy Sapola. She's a pharmacist. She worked at Mayo Clinic. She is our director of pharmacy with an F here. Her job really is on health and wellness. And the idea that like in the future, we can grow vegetables prescribed by physicians and paid for by pharmaceutical companies, or like, let's say paid for by insurance providers and say like, instead of a doctor writing you a prescription for something, you know, it's writing you Percocet, let's say, um, what, what about parsnips? You know, like, and will that lab help us with the nutritional analysis required to produce a, a product that is prescribable, right? And I think there's some healthcare companies out there in the world that are, they're ultimately investing more in preventative maintenance than solving the problem once it's a problem. Because the moment that like your stage four cancer is discovered, it's a lot more expensive than attacking it when it's stage one or zero, right? Um, when it's a seed. And I think like, hopefully in my world, what, I, what I'd like to see is I'd like to see vegetables actually part of the sort of the conversation, you know, when, when it comes to medicine. If I were to say and throw a dart on the future, we're certainly investing in that concept right now, but I would really like to see that, that come to life. She works full time. I mean, what is a, a, a vegetable farm doing with a, a PhD on staff full time? It's amazing. Yeah. And that all used to be, I feel like that was all, everything you kind of just described was maybe a Hollywood and everything is skewed it, but back in the fifties and sixties, that was, you know, medicine where like, I feel like the first thing that, you know, anybody would say when they went to the doctor, they'd be told is like, well, you, you probably need to eat more fruits and vegetables, lose about, you know, 10 pounds and it'll, it'll help with, you know, your breathing or, you know, your knees hurt or whatever, you know what I mean? And somewhere it kind of, yeah, it shifted to like, yeah, just take this pill. That'll fix it. And it kind of took the onus off the person and probably the personal responsibility and, you know, looking at oneself and going like, yeah, am I doing the things that I should be doing or am I just doing what I want to do and I'll f- figure out whatever the repercussions are later. There's a really, really, really big business out there, you know, built around like what the doctor scribbles down on that piece of paper. And yeah, parsnips don't necessarily uh, fit the special interests of the people who paid for the pad of paper. Um, I, I think, uh, I don't know. I think you're right. Um, but like I said earlier, like the carrot's not a carrot, you know, they're not all created equal. And so a, a doctor can't, really legally or even in any good conscience, just suggest that people just go eat a a carrot because they're not all nutritionally present where pharmaceutical industries really do well is consistency because you know what you're getting, you know, and it's dosed out. The nutritional levels in vegetables, in fact, have reduced, right? Since the 1950s have been declining. And it's the farming practices, the soil quality, it's everything. It's the shipping, it's the storage, it's everything. It's sort of a factors in that, but they're not, they're really not what they were even 70 years ago. So we got a handful more questions for you. Some of these we asked to everybody that that comes on the podcast, a nice compare and contrast across the episodes. But uh, before we get to those, a couple other questions. So this one was left behind from our previous guest. Master Smalley, Chris Bates uh, over at FLX Hospitality in G- the Geneva, New York area. He left behind for you. What was the last meal you cooked for yourself and what made it special? Yesterday, we did this thing um, at the house. My girlfriend, fiance now, she's Jewish and she grew up with this sauce that I'd never heard of called soy ve. Soy ve is like this condiment. Um, it comes in a big bottle. It's got some 
Chinese sort of characters on it. It's got sesame seeds in it. It's basically a sweet soy with like some chilies. We took um, some zucchini and white asparagus and some bok choy and various stuff from the market. We chopped it up. I threw it in a pan. I dumped the soy vey on it. Well, that soy vey sort of pulled moisture from the vegetables. So it was like wet and kind of gross. So I just pushed all the vegetables to the side and let all the moisture that purged from the vegetables with the salt, and whatever else, sort of come to the center of the pan and caramelize. Right. And I let that continue until it was like, like this, like dark, sort of salty, spicy, you know, sweet caramel. And was basting that on the vegetables. I seared a few pieces of like halloumi and mixed it in, transferred it to bowls and we ate. It took all of 10 minutes. It really celebrated everything that we picked up at the farmer's market over the weekend. And to me, it was special because it was made with this ridiculous sauce that Morgan grew up with. And just figuring out how to, how to sort of make it work. It was very good. It was very, very good. Delicious. That was the last thing I cooked for myself last night. What question do you want to leave behind for the next guest? What vegetable did you grow up hating and have come to love and why? Next question comes from one of our listeners. How has your cooking style evolved over the years now that you mostly work with vegetables and and fruits more so than meat? Because of our growing pantry, right? The ingredients in the field that are always changing. I can't rely on specific I don't really rely on specific size and spec. I rely on specific technique, right? And I know that, let's say, at 2.5% salt by weight left on basically any vegetable with increased surface area at room temp, will lacto-ferment that ingredient, right? Whatever that ingredient is. And so, like, if I try to rely on specific ingredient year round, it would be very difficult and almost devastating. You know, it'd be very, very difficult. So like we, I spend a lot of time developing technique, right? I was like, what's that thing? I can bring one over, but there's no video podcast. Like this last week, I've been working on a, for Hendrix Gen, working on a um, new salt sort of twill that is clear, that can suspend other ingredients in it and be crispy, but not sweet, salty. And so then like, you know, set out then to like, you know, find like, find like nine different starches, hydrate them at different levels, dry them all, bake them all, fry them all, you know, eat them all raw, pre-gelatinized or not, you know? And so we work with, until we've ultimately come to the, the vision and that technique now becomes part of our thing right? It comes, becomes part of our style and our approach, right? And it's like, I, if I want a crystal clear, salty, not sweet twill um, to suspend other ingredients in, let's say herbs, I now can do that. And it doesn't matter what the ingredient is. It doesn't matter what season we're in. It doesn't matter. Nothing else matters now. Like it's a thing that I can live on and sit on and, and, and use and utilize, uh, in this kitchen forever. And that, that no matter what season, and I think that those are the sorts of things that are really, really important for us in establishing. And then as, as ridiculous as this salty crystal clear twill sounds, it's just like an example of, uh, of thing that makes us who we are. Who was the biggest influence on your cooking career thus far? When you look back on it, I think as a whole farmer Lee, Jones was the biggest influence on my cooking career. And I'll just say Farmer Lee Jones is like sort of the the guy, not the brand, the guy. You know, he has always sort of like, you know, sort of pushed me to, you know, celebrate certain things and ingredients no matter what. And it's been really helpful. What's one kitchen item that's not a knife that you can't live without? Yeah, one kitchen item, not a knife you can't live without would probably be a good, just a good open steel pan. You know, with a with a small lip, you know that um, that could hold liquid, but didn't need to hold a whole lot of liquid. Nice long handle I could put on a, any hot surface. I wouldn't require a towel then to grab it. And I'd have a knife in that; I'd probably be fine. Restaurant you recommend that isn't your own? I guess that sort of depends. That's a hard one, and I and I, I would run the risk of pissing a lot of friends off if I even answered it. So, 
So scenario I usually give is, you know, person gets stuck at the airport. So let's call it the Cleveland airport, since that's probably the nearest major airport. And they're stuck overnight. They reach out to you and say, hey, you know, where should we eat? We're stuck here. You know, you guys are, are not open um, that day, you know, and you point them in this direction. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you're in Cleveland, you go into Larder. That's the thing. You're going to go visit Jeremy. You're going to go get yourself like a, you know, fried chicken sandwich, maybe some vegetable charcuterie. You'll get a little like, you know, like, like wild foraged root beer of some kind and uh, you're going to love it. And then you're not going to miss your flight. You just go. Regionally, I think that that's a much easier question for me. If you tell me what city you're in, I'll tell you where to go. Bucket list travel destination, bucket list restaurant. So any place you haven't been to that you want to visit and any place that you haven't dined at that would you'd like to get to eventually? I haven't done any of like Patagonia, like Southern, Southwestern, South America that I'd really, really like to get down there. I haven't also done, and I'm not even ready to open up the like the South Asia bucket list chapter. Um, I really, I'm not prepared mentally for that trip. Those are two that I, that I'd like to really spend a lot of time in. And then I don't know, bucket list restaurants. I really don't have any, uh, like, you know, before I die, I must eat in this place kind of thing. I don't, I've been fortunate to have traveled and eaten at a lot of really, really, really great restaurants. A lot of people in this industry don't get that luxury. I'm grateful for it. And I, I won't add to that list. Just hope it keeps happening. Craziest thing you've seen happen in a restaurant while you're working? I won't name the restaurant, but I was working on the line of a restaurant for a couple shifts in a stage and saw a uh, kid get punched in the face by, uh, by the chef, a reputable, well-known chef. And uh, the drawer pulled out into him, you know, very violently just to get the, the dish out or the job done or whatever. And I do, I was young, but I do remember thinking like, this is archaic. You know, and it is the past. And I do, do think that style of management, as prevalent as it was uh, when we were growing up in this space, is sort of somewhat gone. The, the chefs that don't do that are celebrated more often now than the chefs that do. And I'm grateful for that. I knew that I would never lead in that fashion. As hard as it is sometimes and as bad as you, you might want to punch someone in the face, it's just stupid. You know, it's just a stupid, ridiculous uh approach to, um, you know, creating a, a culture and, you know, one that's worth living in. So that was pretty crazy. I think it's probably the craziest thing I've ever seen in the kitchen. Food or drink guilty pleasures or anything that, uh, you know, is terrible for you, but you just can't help yourself. Fast food, candy, anything like that. I'm a French fry guy. I will do every, you know, I am very particular about the French fries though. I'm like, I'm not, I don't like those big waffle ones. That are soggy in the boat, the little paper boat. I hate those French fries. Um, I like the way Shake Shack sort of like turned that French fry on its head. It's the same cut, but it's crispy every time somehow. I like the thin French fries. You know, I like uh, waffle fries. I like all the French fries generally. I love them. They're they're delicious. And drink, Morgan and I, we own um, we own two coffee shops in town. So I love a good cup of coffee every morning. I'm, I'm the guy that's not good for business. I'm the black coffee, small black coffee every day. So that's a guilty pleasure in the morning, a small black coffee, and then a, a small pour of some random kind of whiskey at night is generally my go-to. And the rest of that is water, you know, water, water, tons of water, water everywhere. I don't feel guilt when I consume any of those things. Favorite Instagram account you follow? I've got one that our photographer for the book, um, Yasi Arefi, she turned me on to this guy in New York whose Instagram is uh, Palm Queen. And he is an unbelievable storyteller. And just, I just say like, is uh, he's like the guardian of every variety of Apple ever. Right. And so like, he'll take like an Instagram photo of a beautiful Apple on a background that somehow relates to its story. And it just tells a, a brief story about that apple. And he's done hundreds of varieties of apples. And he tells really, really good stories. And you learn so much, you know, from him, this sort of eccentric lover of apples. I, lo- I love him. I love his style. And I, you know, hope to, hope to be able to one day find someone that can do that with, with vegetables or be that myself. You know, he's the guy. 
favorite dish thing you ever cooked, created, you know, looking back on your career, you can kind of point to this as your aha moment. Like you knew you could be a, a professional chef one day. No, you know, I'm always, I'm just like eternally critical and forever critical. So, I mean, we have like good stories and moments and things like that. And I've got a few, you know, memorable dishes that people talk about, but I don't think that any of them was an aha moment, you know, really for me as like a future in this industry. I've had a few bites of food uh, that really said, I'm going to, I'm going to pursue this. And, it, and they were not food that I cooked, you know, it was like a, just like rare piece of squab with a burnt onion and a red glass of red wine and a nice little sauce, you know, that's just like, will forever haunt me, things like that. I'm an Anthony Bourdain fan, but not everybody is. Uh, if you were, was there a moment episode scene uh, that stands out to you uh, about him? Or if you weren't, was there any sort of other culinary personality, somebody on TV that you kind of gravitated towards when you're coming up through your career? He definitely like was able to sort of through use food as a medium to tell like much, much, much bigger stories than, you know, the restaurant itself. Um, but there were a few moments for me that touched me. You know, I remember watching Jose Andreas, like cut open a tomato at a farmer's market and celebrate the, you know, little gelatinous seeds inside as a specific part of that plant. It's just like really great. And then like years later coming to know him really well as a human and, um, has really meant, you know, sort of a lot to me. So that moment on TV, watching this crazy Spanish guy yell about tomatoes um, has stuck. I don't remember a lot of that, the episodes. Other people I followed growing up that really impacted me was the Ideas and Food group, Alex and Aki. Um, the Talbots created a blog that was not complicated. It was one sentence per day, every day, forever. And sometimes it was more and sometimes it was less, but I, I followed that as a way. And it really helped, I think, me think about things differently. They were not recipes or anything like that. It was just ideas and food it was hugely impactful early on for me, media wise. Where can people find you? Social media, website, plug everything. Home delivery at Farmer Jones Farm. The restaurants, obviously, uh, on Instagram can be found uh, at Farmer Lee Jones. That's where you'll see the majority of the chef's garden sort of stuff. I'm at, you just search Jamie Simpson on, um, on anything. You know, I've got something there. And I'm not the car dealership, Jamie Simpson. I'm the one with Chef White's on that one. Just click on that one, you'll be in there. This is a much better task for our marketing team, you know, <laughs> just, just, you know, like plug in. Someone's throwing something at me right now. But the bulk of it home, you know, if you're at home and you're listening to this, check out Farmer Jones Farm. If you are, you know, in a restaurant somewhere and you're listening to this, check out the chef's garden. And if you're in the area, you know, we've got an Airbnb right upstairs that is at Culinary Vegetable Institute. How you can participate, walk through the garden with us. We've got 30 beehives, a handful of chickens, and 600 varieties of vegetables here. So, and if uh, you know restaurants want to get in touch with you guys to do a retreat there or, or anything, how do they just go through the website contact page? Yeah, that would be like a culinary vegetable. You or go to the chef's garden and you'll get directed to here. But um, the culinary vegetable institute is generally the the place. You know, if you were going to come out. Um, do his menu development or like just some culinary development with your team. You want to just unplug and reset, rewind, close your restaurant down for two days, damn it. You know, and like just come out, you, housing's handled, um, food's handled. You just got to get here. It's a great opportunity for people. Yeah. It's an awesome thing that you guys got going on there. Uh, I can't wait to see kind of where you guys continue to expand and explore everything that you guys have going on and definitely always keeping an eye out for whenever you guys start doing uh you know a dinner or two again to to make it up there uh finally uh so i'm really hoping i didn't miss out on that chance before covid but if i did it, it's okay but yeah you guys got it's just an awesome place and it just looks awesome from everything i've seen so uh definitely looking forward to coming up there and, and checking it out for myself in person it really is awesome you know there's nothing like it it's an agricultural model unparalleled and you should definitely you're two hours away you know like just get and get in your car and drive up I can, i'll see you by four yeah we'll, we'll definitely make a trip up there uh me and my wife and and check it out and i'll definitely reach out to you we'll get that set up 
appreciate you coming on, taking some time. I know you guys are busy. Um, you're always hosting somebody or something or some event or something that you're working on. So I know you're a busy guy with everything you got going on, but really appreciate you coming on. Uh, if you ever need anything from us, you know, feel free to reach out. Let us know. We always want to support everybody that comes on as much as we can uh, to as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. If there's anything we can do for you, same. We're here for you. Thank you, sir. A big thanks again to Chef Jamie Simpson for taking some time out of his morning, coming on the podcast, chatting about his career, everything that they got going on at CVI, kind of past plans, future plans, things that they're working on, upcoming projects, and potentially upcoming events too as well. It just seems like a really cool place, this kind of awesome farm in the middle of nowhere, but kind of also surrounded by everything at the same time with kind of the location being 20 minutes south of Sandusky, you know, an hour east of Toledo, an hour west of Cleveland. So really looking forward to getting up there and checking out the farm and everything ourselves. Um, Make sure to check them out on Instagram. You can follow uh, Jamie. It's at James underscore Simpson 86. And then also at Culinary Vegetable Institute. Uh, both on Instagram. Check out their website, uh, culinaryvegetableinstitute.com. More information on there in terms of if you want to do a restaurant retreat with your staff or anything like that, you want to go up there for menu development, you want to just go up there and stay, uh, in terms of ordering produce um, too as well, there's a whole bunch of different things you can do with them. So they're kind of open to anything and everything. If you want to host an event there, um, you can reach out to them through the website and, and they can get back to you with details and work on getting that set up. Make sure to check out uh, us on Instagram too, as well at Spoon Mob, uh, Twitter and Facebook. We're on there. Check out our website, spoonmob.com. Feel free to write in questions, comments, feedback, either through the contact portal on our website or directly spoonmob at yahoo.com is our email. Um, so feel free to send over anything. Appreciate everybody listening. I appreciate everybody who's continued to refer us to other chefs uh, and restaurants and continue to help spread the word. You know, we wouldn't be growing as much as we are without you. So, you know, we definitely appreciate that. Continue to do so too as well. You know, next time you go to a restaurant uh, that you heard about on the podcast, you know, make sure to to drop that line to the hostess or your server or whatever, you know, that helps us out uh, more than anything, telling people that you heard about us on the podcast and everything. That's always great to see, and it's great for the restaurants to hear that them coming on the podcast had some impact uh, on their operations, too, as well. So uh, without any kind of further updates, um, that's it for this week, and we will talk to you guys next week.